Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. of each of us, let each one find you mighty to save, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. reading from Deuteronomy. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at the time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Armenian was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number. And there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord God of our ancestors. And the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place 
place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you shall, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. We will read the portions of Psalm 91 appointed for today responsibly by a half verse. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High abides in the shadow of the Almighty. He shall say to the Lord, You are my refuge and my stronghold, and my God in whom I put my trust. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the most high your habitation, there shall no evil happen to you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you in their hands. Lest you your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and adder. You shall trample the young lion and the serpent under your feet. Because he has bound to me in love, therefore will I deliver him. And I will protect him because he knows my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. And I am with him forever. I will rescue him and bring him to honor. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. <laughs> between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Glory to you, Lord Christ. After his baptism, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing, and all those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this, this authority, for, this, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. <clears throat> the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hand they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. There are six verses missing from the lectionary version of the psalm this morning. Three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. It's hard to understand why that should be. Listen to these missing verses, which I'm going to read to you, and hear if they strike a chord with you today. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. The whole of Psalm 91 is a psalm of protection. And these are the verses, these missing verses, invoked by Jews and Christians, including Orthodox Christians, many of whom believe that the person who recites it with faith in God will be helped in time of danger, whether that is danger from demons or from evil thoughts or from exactly the dangers pronounced, the enemy who comes under the cover of darkness, war, and disease. You know we pray or we recite psalms every week, and if we are praying the daily office on our own, we say them frequently, all 150 in the space of a month. My impression is that we pray them or recite them, and sometimes we even chant them without paying much attention to them at all. But in times of trouble, and sometimes in times of triumph, nothing in the Bible can reach us quite like the Psalms do. Still, perhaps it is necessary to be in the throes of a crisis to pray Psalm 91 with the fervor it deserves. Maybe we need to be sick, or persecuted, or fleeing from our homes, 
or bullied or emotionally beleaguered to say the words, he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Do you hear the tenderness toward the person who is at the end of their rope? Do you hear the defense of the person seeking refuge? The softness of a hen's wing and the steeliness of defensive weapons. And for this reason, Psalm 91 is also known as the soldier's psalm or the soldier's prayer. And soldiers are given bandanas by some Christian organizations with this psalm printed on it, which they carry with them as they go to their military deployments. And I think of the people now besieged in Ukraine, who, if the news reports from the BBC and NPR are true, they are praying for protection. But here, right here, during this season of Lent, where for the most part most of us are safe most of the time, do we think we need the sort of protection, that sort of level of protection from war, disease, and danger that stalks under cover of darkness? We probably don't think we do. Yet, we may be in protection, we may be in need of protection more than we appreciate. We don't realize it until we find ourselves in the wilderness. And the wilderness is just not some place out on a mountain or in the desert. The wilderness is that desolate place without shelter, a place without sustenance, and it is out there for us. It is the place where we feel exposed and dwell with our own thoughts. It need not be a physical place at all. Into just this sort of wilderness, the Holy Spirit drove Jesus after his baptism, a place where he was exposed, where there was no shelter and nothing to sustain him. But how hard it is to sit quietly with our own thoughts. Our minds go in every direction. The wilderness, the desolate place into which the Spirit urges us, it frightens us because we are exposed. We feel there is nothing there except ourselves. And it's there, if we have the courage to go, that we encounter the adversary. And when I say adversary, I'm just using a translation of the word Satan, which means the adversary. I don't like people to think about smoky little men with horns and tails and pitchforks I mean, what good does that do any of us in this day and age? And that's not really who the devil is for us. We go to these quiet places, these desolate places, where we encounter the adversary, and we experience the same temptations that Jesus did. And no, the devil is not asking us to turn stones to bread. Instead, our greedy minds, hungry for this and that, wander away toward what we might acquire and how we might get it. And will it be enough? Is there ever enough to feel secure? You can never have enough, says the adversary, not as long as someone else has something more than you do. And no, the devil is not going to lead you to a high place to show you all the nations of the world so that you can exert power over them. And by the way, Satan cannot deliver on this promise. The nations do not belong to him. But our minds wander instead to how we can control the people we live with, whether family or co-workers or even your neighbors and friends, because it's satisfying if you can cajole or bargain or browbeat somebody into doing what you want them to do. Or you might think you deserve their respect or you might think you have earned their respect, and you might feel entitled. You could be a somebody, says the adversary. And no, the devil will not take you to the top of a tower and tempt you to jump in expectation that angels will come to your rescue. And by the way, just note how Satan can quote scripture for his own purposes, as we say. 
Our minds wander instead to tempting fates in other ways, to risk not only our health and our safety, but the health and safety of all who know us, love us, depend on us, live near us, work with us, so we end up dragging them down with us as we fall. The desolate place is the place of confrontation. It's where we encounter the temptations Jesus knew. It is also where we find the presence of God. The desolate place is not uninhabited, nor does it belong to the adversary, for God dwells there too. <clears throat> That's the whole point. Jesus is in the wilderness. Emmanuel is there tempted in every way as we are. And remember, there is no place where God is not also present. To say that God is not present in some place is to limit the power of God. That doesn't mean the adversary isn't present as well, but God is there. During Lent, I try to take some time, and I know that others of you do as well, to read, reflect, and there are so many little books and other studies, but this is one I really like. It's called Christ in the Wilderness by Stephen Cottrell. It's Reflections on the Pleadings of Stanley Spencer. And I've given you an illustration of one of the paintings. I don't know if you all picked that up. Thank you, Richard. And for the congregation at home, I'm just going to step down here, hold this up, and hope that they can see it. And I promise I will put this in a place where you can see it this afternoon on Facebook. So I've been reading this little book very slowly, savoring it, really. The artist Stanley Spencer was an unusual character. I, frankly, all artists are unusual characters. He made a name for himself around World War I, painting traditional Christian subjects, but setting them in his small English village of Cookham along the Thames River. Jesus carried his cross up the village main street the resurrection set in the village churchyard. Spencer did landscapes and portraits as well. He had to in order to make a living. But his great dream was to decorate the 40 panels in the ceiling of his village church with images of Christ during his 40 days in the wilderness. He acknowledged that in scripture not a great deal happens during most of those 40 days. But in his artistic imagination, Spencer pictured Christ and nature. Christ, the one through whom all things were made, dwelling in the midst of his own creation. The artist completed eight such paintings over a couple of decades. He never did all of them. They were displayed in the village church, although not on the ceiling as the artist had originally intended, and for some reason, they ended up in a gallery in Perth, Australia. Today, I'm sharing with you the one that's called The Scorpion. In all of his paintings, Christ is a very sturdy, bulky figure. He seems in this one to rise up out of the landscape of bare hills. Doesn't he sort of blends in with his shoulders and his head? But still, for all his size and strength, he looks exhausted and sunburnt. His bare feet are exposed to the stony ground, where he might well dash his foot against a stone. But I want you to look at what Christ is holding in his hands. That scorpion is right at the center of this painting. There it is. It's got its tail raised, and it looks like it's ready to strike. But see, see how Christ holds it gently and just gazes at it, contemplates it. It's very peaceful. He 
has, as the author writes, arrived at a complete acceptance of God's will. He looks upon the scorpion with tender longing. He is not afraid of its sting. I don't know, what else do any of you see? Don't be shy. I know some of you are art appreciators and look carefully at these things. We always look for position, light. Pardon me, Stuart? His fingers look like pebbles. His fingers look almost like pebbles. They're really sort of bulky and thick, aren't they? He's very. Oh, it looks like his hands are swollen. Others have noticed that about this too. There's a scorpion by his foot. There is also a scorpion down there by his foot, right? And it's got its tail arched too, like it's about to sting. He will be put his billowy. Yes, I agree. His robe is billowy, and we remember that it was the spirit that drove him out into the wilderness. And the word in both Greek and in Hebrew for spirit is the same word as for breath or for wind. Uh, so there is this sense of movement. Uh, it's not static, really. I mean, Christ is sitting down as a you know big guy and this bulky figure, but his robe seems to have been moving. This is the beauty of art. When you contemplate art, you can find so much if you just allow your eye to wander for a while. Elsewhere, later in Luke's Gospel, Jesus will rejoice over his disciples after he sent them out into the towns and villages to the places that he planned to go. And they come back and they report that um, people were healed, uh, they were able to cast out demons, and Jesus says over his disciples, I have given you power to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and none shall hurt you. Christ confers on his disciples the courage they need for their own wilderness times. Remember, I said God is always present. And that courage is for us too. The Lord is with us in time of trouble. Now, I just want to take a moment to say something about prayer, especially in this time when the world seems crazy and lots of people are praying. And some people are tempted, as any of us are tempted, to say, what good is it to pray? I want you to be able to pray a psalm like Psalm 91 in confidence. Prayer is not like putting a coin in a vending machine expecting the thing you want to drop into your waiting hand. That is not what prayer does. The power of prayer is in the process and in the praying and has much more to do with transforming the person who is praying. Prayer in time of danger tempers us. It prepares us to face what is coming. It tempers our expectations and it gives us comfort in turning to God, knowing that the thing we might ask for today may not be the thing we get, but we will be heard. And prayer will work in ways that we can hardly understand. And that by allowing ourselves to sit in contemplation and pray, we open ourselves to accept what the Father has in store for us. And we find a way to be brothers and sisters with Christ and with one another. For surely, as the psalm says, God is with us in time of trouble, ready to accompany us in our desolate places and rescue us from the adversary. Amen. Let us affirm.
confirm our faith through the words of the ICT. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified with Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for all the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church, Church of God, for the unity of all people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, William, our bishop, Megan, and Ali, our priest, also our deacon, and for all who minister in the church, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Joseph, our president, Philip, our governor, for the leaders of the nation, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this town, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth that God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, for the sick and the suffering, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who have asked our prayers, including Joyce, Vivian, Patsy, Carol, Janine, Patricia, Barbara, Barbara, Cruz, Carol, Barbara, Herb, Mildred, Valerie, Marianne, John, Robert, Sharon, Tom, Nesta, Hyper, Jake, Silver, Sean, Taylor, Stephanie, Tom, Rob, and Yvonne. We pray also for Pastor Ali and the staff and patients of Trenton Psychiatric Hospital, and for John and the staff of and patients of and Crime Forensic Center, and for those we now name. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those celebrating birthdays today, including Robert Lewis and Jimmy Roundtree, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, including Caroline, and for all who departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Our 
absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Luke, and all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our lives to Christ our God. To you, O Lord our God. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Please take a moment to greet. Good morning. Good morning. So you can see just from the appearance of the church and the change in the liturgy, that we have moved into that reflective and penitential season of Lent. And I hope that each of us will take advantage of this time to slow down, to reflect, to observe, and to allow ourselves to soak in the experience of being God's children and just allow ourselves to calm down and sit with it and understand the need for reflection and repentance and a turning again away from the busyness of life and toward our Lord. So in order to encourage people in some way, I, I would suggest that perhaps you join us on Wednesday for prayer at noon, which we do by conference call. Or uh, join us on Friday evening for Stations of the Cross, which we are doing by Zoom only, not here, but uh, Deacon Vasu leads it. And we, we have the prayers, we all participate, and we see the images. And, that's, and then find ways on your own. As you know, we have been invited by Trinity Church to participate in a book study that begins on Wednesday. And I have the Zoom link, and I have the meeting ID if you prefer to use that. And if you're going to be part of this book study, get in touch with me. We're leading cast. I have uh, given away, I think, nine books, maybe 10. Uh, all the books I had uh, have been taken, but you can easily download it on your Kindle, if you have a Kindle, or uh, get a copy through Amazon. Uh, and join us. I think it's going to be very interesting. Other churches in the Princeton area will be joining as well. So get in touch with me if you want the link. And finally, let me just make a little plug for Meg's opera. Meg, I'll do this for you. Uh, the opera is coming along. We had our dress rehearsal yesterday. Um, the voices are wonderful. The uh, singers who are playing, the young Kathy, the older Kathy, and Heathcliff, they just are wonderful, and the music is so interesting. Um, and we have volunteers helping with ushers and, you know, setting, changing scenes and things like that. Um, we have uh, a tiny pit orchestra, and you know, I think it's a wonderful work. And one of the things that St. Louis has done over the years is engaged in artistic pursuits, musical pursuits, and we have sponsored musicians. We've enjoyed musicians here at St. Luke's. So I hope you'll consider coming. And it will be also uh, visible through YouTube, and there's some information about that on the back table. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts. <laughs>
gifts of God to the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Bow your heads before the Lord. Grant, Almighty God, that your people may recognize their weakness and put their whole trust in your strength, so that they may rejoice forever in the protection of your loving providence through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. 